Equal Topics, a podcast for women in midlife and beyond. At Hot Flashes and Cool Topics, we talk about anything and everything to do with midlife. My name is Colleen. My name is Bridget. And today we have a really fun episode. You guys are going to really laugh through a lot of it. Uh, Carrie Lizer, who is a co-executive producer of Will and Grace, creator and executive producer of The New Adventures of Old Christine, and a new show coming on called Call Your Mother with Kira Sedgwick. She has a lot of hats, as we always say a lot of women do. But she also wrote a book called Aren't You Forgetting Someone? Essays from My Midlife Revenge which is a hysterical book, that you, very quick, very light oh reading. Goodness. You'll be mm-hmm. spending so much time going, oh my God, that's me. Oh my God, that's mm-hmm. me. She's, and look, she's spying on me. She sees what's right. happening. And like, Just, and yeah. even, if, even if it wasn't you, you could relate to why these stories were in the book. They're short story, uh, kind of short paragraphs of experience she had, you know, in the start of raising three kids because she has twins and a younger son. And then kind of as they get older, leaving the house to go to college and what her life was like going through divorce. And then kind of her career she started as an actress. I guess I should have said that from the beginning. She's an oh, actress, okay. <laughs> producer, writer, and kind of creating her, her professional career along with the chaos of raising three kids. Mm-hmm. Um, but Bridget has one story that I think oh my, she you guys- stood out to her. It, well, it did, but her book, it's just, you know, the way she tells the story, um, it's also on audiobooks too, and just the way she does it, but one story, I couldn't believe it, because she was starting out as a young actress, and the show Growing Pains was on, and she, you know, gets a part on it, or not, you know, gets gets to have a little part on it, a guest part on it, and she goes on the show, she's only 20 years old, and Alan Thick hits on her but she doesn't realize it at first so you'll have to read the book to hear how it all works out because you know if you are a young actress and first of all if you even get on a show like that is a very big deal even if it's a minor part it is a very big deal that you get you have to audition for that part and probably do callbacks and everything and get back on and to get that part on that show and yeah I, I just couldn't believe it because she kind of hits on that just a little bit in the, right. in the book at uh, just have being a woman in this career and having to fight through things in this career. But I was just so angry when I read right. that. Right. And it was just yeah. a creepy way he tricked her to his house. And yes, it's yes. just the it whole tricks, thing. Yeah, she yeah. thinks she's going to have lunch and see this in her naive 20s yeah but you know too that's just such a power play because he was the star of the show and she is just a guest and then how the other stars would got side-eyed her and just kind of wouldn't you know talk right and then right she comes back and she didn't do anything but they think this anyway so and then he was a total jerk to her when she wasn't going to play along with his plan. Right. You know? And I think, yeah. you know, and it's interesting because fast forward 30 years and how she would have handled that now oh, would I have know. been very different. And she right. tells the stories of being the only female in a writing group of men mm-hmm. for a lot mm-hmm. of shows. But, you know, as she got more powerful, she her voice got stronger, which I think for a lot of women, we can relate to that. Um, mm-hmm. And she talks about, you know, one of her children coming back and what that was like in the dating world for a second. Because she was single since, I think mm-hmm. she was married for nine years and then she was single for a lot of it. And it's just, it's a take, you know, I love the review Julie Louis-Dreyfus left for her. Mm-hmm. Carrie Lizer writes about being the child of parents, being the parent of children and being a middle-aged adult with brutal honesty, a tender heart and a wicked sense of humor. Mm-hmm. And that really does describe the book, you know? Yes, um, yes. And so we're going to let her tell the story because we had a great conversation with her. We hope you enjoy it. And we will talk to you right after. Welcome back to Hot Flashes and Cool Topics. Today, we have a really cool guest on. Her name is Carrie Lizer. And she just recently wrote a book called Are You Forgetting Someone? Essays from My Midlife Revenge. Um, Carrie is, and we said in the beginning, she's an actress. She was co-executive producer of Will and Grace. She was the creator of The New Adventures of the Old Christine. And you have another show that we'll talk about, but welcome to the show, Carrie. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. We're excited to have the conversation. I have to admit, I read your book in like one day (laughs) (laughs) because it's so funny. It's so relatable. Um, What made you call it essays from my midlife revenge? Why did you think of it as a revenge? Um, I, well, I guess it came off as a little mad. I don't, (laughs) 
<laughs> a little <laughs> bit. Just <laughs> a little, a, a touch mad. I thought I was being lighthearted and funny, and then um, I wrote it in a uh, a writers group that I'm in with a you know a variety of people. The woman who runs the group is uh, named Claudette Sutherland, and she's 81, and um, and there's men in there and women in there, and and some of the people responded like, "Oh, I, I guess you're a, I guess you have a little anger in you." And I thought, "What did that? Was that mad?" And I didn't feel it at all. I really <laughs> so I, I just had to sort of you know roll with it and I guess uh, get it off my chest. Were there any other women in their our age? Because as a woman, uh, you know we're we're all about of a certain age. stage. Yes, primetime life is what we had a guest call it, and I love that. Um, were there any other women? Because as a woman the same age as you, I was like, yeah, I hear where you're coming from. So I didn't even feel the anger. I felt more like the, yeah, okay, I get it. There were, there, yeah, it was, it was an interesting sort of focus group opportunity because there were women my age, and then, like I said, there were men, and then there were young women and young men in there. And so everybody that was listening to it sort of hooked in from a different place. Like the, mm -hmm. the young guys that were in the group were like, I feel terrible. I think I better call my mother. You know, what did I, what did I do when I went away to college? I didn't even think about what she must have been going through. So it was an interesting uh, experiment to um, workshop it sort of uh, around a uh, that kind of diverse group of people. It was it was interesting. But yeah, there were women there that, okay. that were hooked in, uh, hooked in from the get go. Okay. So you have three children, twins, and then you had another son after, which I give you credit because pretty quickly <laughs> after too, like three years, I think is the difference. Were you at that point actively writing in Hollywood or was it, did the kids come first or did the career come first? Um, I, the, the career came first. I was writing when I had my kids. Fortunately, I had transitioned from acting to writing. So um, which was fortunate because I think being an, an actress and trying to have kids, be pregnant, um, be fat, <laughs> be, <laughs> you, know, you know, breastfeed, all of those things I think is much more challenging than it was. It was challenging, but I think less so than if I was an actor. Um, so I, uh, I was, had just sort of started my writing career when I got pregnant with the twins. But um, it, it worked out well in that I could, um, you know, I could I could go to work pregnant. I w I did work on a staff of all men and all young men, um, so <laughs> they sort of really got a um, a window into their future that they probably didn't want. As I waddled into work every day and um, you know grew before their eyes, and then came back to work with my breast pump and stored my breast milk in the in the you know, communal refrigerator. And um, so it was, it was an experience for all of us, but yeah, I was, I, I worked throughout. I think I took um, not very much time off, maybe six weeks or eight weeks or something like that with the twins mm -hmm. and went right back. And they came with me, you know, um, especially my youngest son, um, he, because I was running a show at that point when he was born. And so I had a little bit more leverage. I had a little bit more power at that point. And so I was able to bring him to work with me and, um, which was, you know, good and bad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> how, did that, how did that opportunity come about that you were able to get your own show? Um, it was a little fast. And I think I'm lucky that after that first opportunity that I got another opportunity because I really wasn't experienced enough to have my own show. But I had this very <laughs> uh, firecracker agent who um, I was pregnant with my third child. Um, I... And he said, you know, they want you to write a pilot. And I'd been writing, I think, for two years or something. Not very long. Not long enough to write wow. a pilot. And he said, you know, I've got two-year-old twins. I'm pregnant. I really, I think, just, I don't <laughs> think I'm up for this. And he said, just write a pilot. You'll pocket the money. Nothing will happen. Everybody writes a pilot. And it doesn't go anywhere. You'll be fine. So I write the pilot. And somebody bought it. And I was like, oh God, come on. And he, said, he said, it's okay, you'll, you know, so by this time my, my youngest is born. Um, he said, so you'll make the pilot, now I've got three kids under the age of three. He said, so you'll make the pilot. It'll be like putting on a play. Nothing will happen with it. It'll be a lot of fun. You'll make a little more money. It'll go away and then you can just have your kids. Then I get diagnosed with thyroid cancer during all of this while the kids are little. 
I make the pilot, CBS picks it up and puts it on the fall schedule. Now I'm sort of undergoing treatment for thyroid cancer. I have three kids under three. I say to my agent, Scott, what have you done to me? I can't, I can't do it. I can't. He said, oh, you know, you can do it. It's, to, you know, you'll have a lot of help. You'll be, it's great. It's an opportunity. You know, he just didn't bat an eyelash report because he wasn't doing it and he didn't have any of this going on. So it mm -hmm. all sort of, it was like a firestorm of craziness. Great opportunity, but it was really bad timing as it turned out. And so the show went on the air. I'm dragging, you know, thyroid, I, you know, if you're going to get cancer, mm -hmm. that's sort of the kind to get. And mm -hmm. I went through the treatment. I had my kids. I'm dragging my infant to work with me and breastfeeding on breaks. And uh, the twins are doing what they're doing and, you know, coming to work when they can. And it just, it was, um, it was a bit of a, of a, a mess, honestly. I just, I didn't have the brain cells. Uh, there was too much going on. I held it together. I did okay. We got through one season, but honestly, I didn't, I couldn't find my voice. I didn't really know how to do it. I hadn't, um, mm -hmm. I hadn't, I hadn't come up through the ranks. So I didn't, I didn't um, know the process and I was sort of flying by the seat of my pants and I didn't really even know what my job was. So I was listening to everybody's opinion. I thought I had to take everybody's opinion. I thought that that's what my job was. And so I lost my way in a little bit. And so I think I'm very lucky that I got another opportunity after that to um, learn properly and do it the right way and sort of take a step back and have a, have a restart a little bit. Mm -hmm. Were you probably in about your 30s when all this happened? I, I was curious because I can remember I'm relating because in my 30s, I felt like everything was a blur. And it yeah. seems like, yeah, as you get a little bit older, just the experience that comes with it and the learning and your kids get a little older. Yeah. And you yeah, get to sit I back for a little bit. In my early 30s, yeah. Mm -hmm. When this happened. I, I was curious about that just because that seems really, it doesn't matter what line of work you're in. I hear so many women talk about that, just right. in that. It's kind of a blur. Job. It's a blur. It a total blur. Like I don't, there are people that were with me during that experience that come up to me and, you know, tell me stories or say, remember this? And I have, I truly, it's like amnesia. I have no, <laughs> I have no recollection of the people, the process, the thing that, you know, um, it's very strange, but it was just, it was too much. It was mm -hmm. just just too much. My plate was too full. And um, like I said, they were glorious opportunities that a lot of people don't get even once in their life. And so I really do feel grateful that, uh, that it wasn't my, that I didn't burn bridges. Mm -hmm. right? like Absolutely. Happened. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When the opportunity to be co-executive producer of Will and Grace came around, that was a little bit later, right? A couple years yes. later? Mm -hmm. A couple okay. years after that, yeah. What was it like writing for Will and Grace? Because it is one of my all-time favorite shows, I'll tell you right now. It's I mean, honestly, show. between your, your book, I felt like, okay, she's talking to me. And then <laughs> Will and Grace, I was like, oh, I can't wait to talk to you. <laughs> but what was it like writing for the show? It was an absolute blast. It really, you know, it's sort of, it was restorative for me after that experience where it wasn't fun. And it really was where I um, sort of, uh, learned what a functional television show looked like because it was so well run. There were so many great people on that show um, that I, that's really where I sort of went to school about how to, mostly the most important thing I learned was, um, and I think the thing that Will and Grace exemplifies is somebody telling an authentic story, like somebody knowing who they are and telling their story and not letting anybody mess with it, not letting the, the network or, or well-meaning whatever, executives coming in there and sort of trying to monkey with your story. But uh, Max Muchnick in particular, one of the creators, and David Cohan is the other creator, but Max Muchnick, it was his story of he being a gay young man and having a, a woman best friend growing up and how that informed his, um, his life and his, and his growing up and his... Um, coming into his own and so when you have and, and what I learned from that is when you have a, a voice and you stay true to it and stay true to telling your story it works 
-hmm. And that's what I didn't do before. And so that's right. what I came away from Will and Grace. And, um, and beyond that, just the experience, it was the funniest group of people <laughs> we say that I've ever been around. I mean, just if you can imagine, I mean, you can't imagine because you do it, but to go into work and just laugh all day long, it also, because it was a big success, we were treated so well, you know, just a bunch of baby comedy writers in there, you know, they feed us, you know, and we just get to sort of toddle around and tell jokes and then go to stage and watch these brilliant actors do their thing and just laugh all day long. And it's glorious, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's a great job. And um, those people are very dear to me. You know, it was just a, a great, weird, interesting <laughs> people, just, I mean, oddballs, every one of uh -huh. them. Uh -huh. And, um, and I love them dearly. It was a really, it was quite an experience. It yeah. was such a groundbreaking show because I can't quite remember because I was in my thirties probably when it started <laughs> and everything's a blur, but when it started, but it was so groundbreaking because yeah. it, it was one of the first, not, not the first, because there were other shows that had gay main characters in it. Uh, but it really was one of the first groundbreaking kind of just brought normalcy to a, to everyday life situations for so many people. I felt like that. Did you guys get a, was there backlash? Was there things like that when it began or how did that go? You know, I mean, the, the great thing about it was that it was always about being funny. Mm -hmm. You know, it was never about wagging your finger at anybody. It was never about <clears throat> um, teaching or teaching anybody a lesson or anything. It was just about being funny, being lovable, talking about friendship and love and being important to people. And um, it always had such heart. And so, yes, there were, you know, I don't remember the specifics either because it's mm -hmm. all a blur to me too. <laughs> but, um, you know, there were whatever the groups were that came at us for sure. But even in those moments, as a writer's room, we would respond to them. We would craft letters in response to the hate mail that we got that were funny you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> comedic responses dear, yeah dear sir um i hear what you're saying and i think you sound attractive as well i think <laughs> <laughs> you know i mean we just there was just no moment where we could take any of it seriously because right. it was all about staying um uh happy and humorous and and where the show lived and because of that there was a buoyancy to it and there mm -hmm. wasn't ever uh, we didn't I don't think anybody really let the hate come in which was oh, good. I think you could feel it mm -hmm. I think you could feel it on that show um mm -hmm. which was great and you know being on the floor of that show for because it was taped in front of a live audience um the the people that would come from far and wide to come watch that show and what it meant to them. It was like, not quite, but a little bit, it was like, you know, people that came to see like the Beatles or something, you saw that it, it you know, that it moved people, that it, it had mm -hmm. changed people, these, you know, young, young men a lot of times where they had saw themselves for the first time uh, mm -hmm. on television and they saw their story or they saw their best friend or they saw, you know, I think it opened up conversations for people to talk to their parents, I think. It did a lot of that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it did sort of change things in a way, but in a in a way that made it funny and light and not um, it. I don't know. Just not it, condemning. It, yeah. Well, I think it, I, there was no shame in it, mm -hmm. and I think right. that, that that goes a long way. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think it really. I think it did a lot. I'm proud that I was there. Yeah, you definitely, it did, never felt like a message was being crammed down your throat during the show. No. It was really just, no. and, it, and a half hour to just laugh. And it was so, it was written with such intelligence and wit that I think a lot of the shows, if I remember, that were coming out during that time were almost talking down in a way to people. Mm -hmm. And this just appreciated the intellect and the humor of life without talking down or trying to preach a message. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's I, just... Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I what think it brought up a lot of people along in that way. And I think it's so, it was so smart. Um, you know, I didn't come on until season three, so it was already going along. You know, it's, I, 
so I can admire it as much as anybody else. It's not my doing. I, but I think it's so smart. I know people, you know, I live in Vermont part of the time in a very rural, very isolated part of Vermont. And um, the man who takes care of my place when I'm not there is this old Yankee guy. You know what I mean? He's just about as far away from a Will and Grace fan as you can imagine. <laughs> and he tells me that he watches, every time it comes on TV, he watches it, uh, you know, on a daily basis and it cracks him up and he loves it. And that's the kind of thing where it's like, nobody is telling him what to think. Nobody mm -hmm. is, like you said, talking down to him. And in that way, it's just sort of bringing a different perspective into his life without, you know, without telling him he was wrong before or right. wrong, you know, and, and it's, I think it's smart. And I think it's, um, I think they did a, a great service and a great mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Were you still working on Will and Grace when the opportunity to create your own show came about with the new adventures of old Christine? Uh, no, I left. Um, I just, I felt like I had, I had done uh, what I could do there. I was sort of, uh, sort of itching to write something new. Um, so I left my friends at Will and Grace and went over to, uh, I made a deal over at Warner Brothers to create new things of my own. Um, and so that's, that's when I did uh, New Adventures of Old Christine. Mm -hmm. And how was that experience? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was just going to say, how was that experience? I was just going to. It was great. It was, um, you know, that was, it, it, it worked. You know, the pieces came together. I wrote the script um, independently of casting. I just wrote it. Uh, it was just an idea that, that was, you know, not, not autobiographical, but, but, pieces of it were, you know, I was, I had gone through a divorce and it was sort of my fantasy of what I wish my, <laughs> my relationship with my ex-husband was, it wasn't, you know, we don't have a terrible relationship, but it wasn't, but my fantasy was that there was, that there was still family, that there would still be a family there. Mm -hmm. And so I sort of wrote it based on, on that idea. Uh, and then the opportunity came to sit down with Julia Louis Dreyfus and see if we connected. Um, and I sort of, I said, yeah. And I, and I knew her from Seinfeld, like everybody else. And I said, I don't really see her as a mother. You know, I really I <laughs> love her. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. But I really, you know, obviously I think she's the funniest person alive, but she seems a little, you know, she's a little brittle. She's Elaine. She's, I don't, you know, yeah. she doesn't mm -hmm. have ovaries to me. I don't know. But, um, <laughs> But yeah, I'll sit down with her. I'd love to meet her. So we we went to uh, breakfast, and uh, it was just a, a love connection. I mean, it was like a great date. We uh, we stayed there for hours and laughed and laughed and laughed and had the greatest time. And she is as warm and wonderful and delightful as you can imagine and we talked about our kids the entire time and how much we love grocery shopping and how <laughs> you know, it's the only time we get away from everything and can like just stroll down the aisle and how peaceful it is and one and she is um you know so much so maternal so warm so mm -hmm. so everything that um that that I wanted her to be and that, um, that I didn't know if she was. And so it was, it was a, a great surprise, but also um, a real perfect fit and a dream for me. I mean, I, I couldn't have, I couldn't have scored more than that. So mm -hmm. it was great. Oh, and I really liked that show a lot. I really did. I, I loved how she just called her new Christine, yeah. uh, new Christine. <laughs> yeah. nice. really, yes. I really thought that was that. a great one. And I was actually, that was what I was going to ask if you had used anything from your life to influence it. Cause I know from your book that you went through a divorce, but you answered that question already. Well, and it really goes to show a lot with timing in life when things mm -hmm. are happening in your life and they kind of mirror or reflect your career because you were writing, it wasn't exactly your life, but you could relate to everything you were writing about, which mm -hmm. was great. And you know, one of the examples I would use is in your book when you talk about leaving your first two kids at college, you wrote a, you wrote a, a pilot. <laughs> that's how you dealt with it. You wrote a TV pilot about a, husband, a 
father and, and mother leaving their child at college. And you were very real and honest about how difficult it was. Um, mm -hmm. What was that like when you were leaving your two kids the first time for college? Because you write in the book that you were overprotective in the beginning, you know, like the whole Ferber method didn't work for you. <laughs> but, uh, and that you were very involved in your children's lives, which I think so many of our listeners can relate to. You know, you're, you're the soccer mom, you're this, you're that, the other thing. And then all of a sudden they want to leave as if, why do you, why is that? Like, when did that become okay that you're just going to leave and fly? But how is that experience for you? Cause you write about it in the book, but I think the listeners would like to hear it. Yeah. You know, um, the thing about it was you spend so much time when you're bringing them up, sort of preparing them to leave. I mean, it, it's, it's mm -hmm. all about that. It's, a, it's about for, for me anyway, and, and this culture of, where will they go to college and making sure it's done right? Because I didn't go to college. I had this special sort of thing on it of, of making sure that they uh, did better than I did and that they got into good colleges and because, and I didn't know the system and I sort of felt like it was a club that I had been kept out of. So I was really on it and I was really, I felt really determined that my kids would be prepared and that they would, um, that they would have the right, that they would get tutored if they needed it and they would have test prep and all of that, that whole world, that whole game was played by me. So everything that I did was sort of in preparation to boot them out of the house. And so then when the time came, it was, I don't know why it was such a shock to my system because it was all I had talked about for years and planned and prepped for that when it came, it was like the bottom dropped out a little bit. And I, even when I think I talk about it in the book too, I, I was writing a play about it. It's all I've been writing about for years now because it really, <laughs> I'm still processing it. I mean, my kids have actually, my twins have graduated from college now. My youngest is, well, we call it his last year. Uh, it's mm -hmm. not, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, this year, yeah. yeah it's <laughs> final, but it's soon. It's happening soon. But, um, <laughs> uh, but you know, they've been out for a long time now. I'm still processing it. I'm still writing about it because it's such. It feels so unnatural to me that they just go away when they're mm -hmm. when it's been your whole identity and like and and as a mother, it became it it was my identity as as a parent, and it was something that. Um, that I, I latched onto, uh, and it uh, became so meaningful to me. So, um, but I went to this playwriting conference. I was writing a play about it uh, first before I wrote a pilot about it. And I went to this playwriting conference in Ohio at Kenyon College, and I'm writing this play. And I, and they read the first couple of uh, scenes of the play, and this man that was in the writing conference for me said, "I don't understand why this is a play." Why is that, is the mother character surprised? I mean, there, he's 18, of course he's leaving the house. And I was like, well, you just wait until you get me. You will also be surprised yes, that they yes. actually walk out the door. You know, you, you sort of think that it's not gonna happen or something or, or that, I don't know, I don't know why. I mean, and not everybody mm -hmm. feels that way. I know people that feel sort of liberated by it. I know you know, it's a different experience. Maybe it's because I feel a little bit robbed because I did have to work so much while they were growing up. And so time felt a little bit more precious to me. I, I felt like, oh, I, I wish I had more time with them. And I don't know what it is, but it was definitely a shock to my system. And, I, oh, yeah. and I'm still sort of um, mourning it a little bit. But then they oh, come yeah. back. Mm -hmm. And it's not quite the same. So it's like, <laughs> this isn't what I missed, really. Yes. Uh, so. It was so relatable in your book. Uh, right. I mean, the phone call that you made to your son and kept leaving the messages, uh, <laughs> the listeners have got to read that part because that is so me. That is, it's, <laughs> I know I did that. I know I did that. You know, just anything. Are you going, did you go register for classes? You better go register for classes. Hey, did you register for classes? And, you know, my husband did the same thing. And then he would get on me. Did you get a chance to call him today and tell him to register for classes? Yeah. And, you know, just everything like that. And I, I definitely went through that whole morning and Colleen knows, because yes. that's been a big topic. We've done a round table <laughs> about empty nesting and, you know, actually one, and there's nothing really great about this pandemic, but they both came back right. for like three months. Yep. And I, I think that really helped heal me of the whole, 
I, like, I, I really, I think I was almost depressed. <laughs> Would you, yeah, I was almost depressed. And they both came back from like March till June. And then I was like, okay, I got that. I, I never <laughs> would have normally gotten that. And now I got it. Maybe I'm cured. So, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. that, that is, yeah, my, my son uh, came home for a few months too. Um, and you can't go back. I mean, that's for, that is what I learned from that. Sure. That it, it that it's not, you think it would be the same. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's not, you know, I mean, your relationship is different and it, it's, uh, you know, he's back, but he didn't want to come out and have dinner with me every night, come out of his room. He was sort of the troll under the bridge a little bit. But, you know, there were no dance parties. There was not, you know, I mean, there was just, um, it's, it is different and it's an adjustment. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's an interesting time for sure. It, it sure is. And you were, you do describe that in the book when he comes back for a couple months and, and how different it was having, you know, because you do get used to your environment when they leave mm -hmm. and it's kind of your nest. And then they come back and they kind of make it whatever they experienced outside the world, they bring it back in. So they're different. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And I have both of mine back home right now. And it is, it's, it's different. She's it's got different. a full house I got right a full now. House. Yes. And I love it, but I uh -huh. have, you know, I have to understand that they're coming to me as 25 and 22, not as, yeah. you know, 18 and, and 15 mm -hmm. or 16 mm -hmm. anymore. Um, so you, you, how many years, it was five years for the new adventures of the old Christine? Five years. Yeah. Five years. Mm -hmm. five years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you talk in your book about, uh, well, I mean, there's so much stuff you talk in the book about, yeah. but I wanted to follow up with the John Edwards section mm -hmm. of the book. Because yeah. I, I actually went to see him one time and I'm a big fan. So the fact that you got a personal, I'm so jealous. Um, <laughs> so, so unfortunately it was around the time where your sister passed away Yeah. and you, which is so creative, you decide you're going to get him on the show so that you can have a reading, which is so clever and so smart. How did that go? Well, um, it, I really have to give credit. Joni Marchenko was the executive producer of Will and Grace at the time and a great, very dear friend of mine. And my sister was dying. Uh, she, my sister had a brain tumor and, uh, which is, you know, very slow and terrible way for anybody to die. And so she, Joni was wonderful throughout that whole experience. Um, and so I, became hooked on John Edward um, during that time. I would just watch him every night and sort of wait for my sister to send me a sign after she passed away. And I would tell Joni about it and she, and she had lost her brother uh, to suicide. And she, so she was very empathetic and said, oh, I'm sure she'll send you a sign through John Edward. I'm sure that's gonna happen. So then one night, John uh, started talking about a Will and Grace episode. He was to the audience and talking about the episode where Grace's water bra starts leaking. Um, and I, you know, jumped out of bed, I was like, this is it, this is my sign, why would he be talking about <laughs> Grace, he's not talking to me, because nobody in the audience was responding to it on the TV show, I was like, this, this is my sign, it's my sister. I go to work the next day, I tell Joni, this is it, my sister was talking to John Edward. Um, she said, we have to call. So she called, he was booked up for years in advance, the show was booked, there was no way, but Joni, is I probably would have let it drop, honestly. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. you know, uh, but Joni uh, said, oh no, we'll, this is gonna happen. And she called the production office and in her official capacity uh, from Will and Grace and said, we want to use him as a guest star on the show. Uh, could he please call us back? And within five minutes, he called. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, uh, and she, you know, chatted him up and he said, well, I'll be in Los Angeles in a few weeks. I'll call you when I'm there. And then I'm thinking, we can't, so now we're scamming him. And I'm thinking, you know, <laughs> he has all the power of the uh, other world uh, on his side and what are we gonna do? And this seems wrong. So he, I didn't expect to hear from him. Uh, and how are we going to, you know, translate this into a reading for me from my sister? And are we actually gonna put him on the show? What's gonna happen? But he called when he was there Joni somehow sweet talked him. She calls me and says, he's had a cancellation of his schedule. Get over the hill right now. He's in West Hollywood in his hotel. He'll see you. So I went over there and anyway, he ended up 
talking to me for hours. Um, he is the kindest, um, dearest, uh, gentlest man. Um, and we talked about all sorts of things. Uh, Joni was on the roof waiting for me by the pool at the hotel. At one point, he brought her brother through because he's saying all these things that I didn't know what he was talking about. He was talking, you know, it sort of went off track because I was sort of understanding what he was saying to me and sort of getting all the stuff. And then suddenly he started saying things. I said, I don't know what that is. I don't, I'm not sure. I don't know what you're saying. And then he said something. I said, I think that's Joni's brother. I said, wait, she's upstairs. And I run upstairs <laughs> to the pool. Like, Joni, your brother's here. And she runs back and she runs down back into the room and uh, she, you know, through John talking to her brother a little bit and then he's gone and then my sister's back and then she goes back up to the pool. I mean, it was the craziest, strangest, um, sort of most comforting, odd thing that happened. Um, it's hard to explain. It was, it's, you know, because it was very, you know, people say, well, maybe he looked you up. Maybe he, you know, he knew who you were. But they weren't things like, oh, your sister lived on this street and you live on this street. It was, it was so, they were strange little things like you knew the name of my kid's four month old hamster that was buried in our backyard. He knew, you know, weird, strange, they weren't big things that he told me, that he talked about. They were small, personal little details. And for whatever it was worth, they were strange little comforting things. And I will say this, and I say this in the book, and if John ever read it or heard about it, I would hope that this isn't an insult to him. It's gonna sound insulting, but I mean it as only a compliment. He is this um, sort of, he was a ballroom dancer. I think he and his wife, I think that's how they met. He is this sort of buff, tan, Long Island guy, sweet as can be. And I'm gonna say not a rocket scientist. You know what I mean? I don't think he is the guy that could pull off this, ex what would be an extraordinarily elaborate scam against humanity right? for hours on end, he would have to do some kind of crazy research. I don't even know how he would do it, first of all, mm -hmm. to pull this off if, if it were a complete hoax and a sham. I just, I don't buy it. I don't, I don't mm -hmm. think this, that is this man that I, I met, this sort of gentle, sweet, lovely um regular dude that i met <laughs> he was you know what i mean that really is uh -huh. who he was. and then and then on top of that um to sort of compound it um a few years later so i never saw him again i never talked to him again we did use him on he was in the show right we, we used him on willing grace uh which was hilarious um <laughs> and then i never saw him again i never talked to him again we didn't maintain contact or anything it was just it was a nice thing that happened in sort of this weird moment in time a few years later, uh, my brother died. Um, he of um, heart failure, meth addiction, very sad. Um, and I got this call out of the blue, and he said, and it was John Edward, and he said, "I'm sorry. I hope this isn't strange or intrusive. I um, I keep hearing your name. I keep hearing your name, hearing your name, hearing your name, and I'm just calling. I didn't even know if it was still your number to see if you're okay." And, uh, and it was, you know, I think three years later. And I said, I'm not okay, actually. My brother just died. And he said, well, I, I keep hearing your name and I keep hearing, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And I just thought I would reach out to you and check on you. And he said, I'm going to be in Los Angeles. Can I come see you? And again, he came out, he came to see me at Warner Brothers. He sat with me for a couple of hours. He brought his funny friend with him from, I think also Long Island. I don't know, these two guys, you know, they were <laughs> like meet stars at Warner Brothers, but I mean, just cute, again, regular guys, but his compassion and his kindness and his humanity were just um, extraordinary and, and, you know, not, you know, fooling around. Like it was, it was a, it was a comfort to me and he was amazing. That's so nice to hear because people are so skeptical of everything. As am I. <laughs> Right. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. So you were on the show, you did the show for five years and then you were done. And at the point where you were, that show had finished, were the kids getting ready to go to college at that point? 
Um, the kids were getting ready to go to college. Yeah, that was right when it was. And uh, Julia Louis Dreyfus's kids were a couple years ahead of mine. And I remember her husband Brad Hall said to me, "Whatever you think it's going to be, it's a thousand times worse." <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and I was like. No, don't <laughs> say that to me. That's yeah. terrible because they were, because he was really, I think he was, he was knocked off his feet by it. You know, they were, they weren't expecting it either. And Andy Ackerman, who directed all of the episodes of Old Christine, uh, same thing. He had, I want to say four kids, but it might even be five. And um, so, and he was a little bit ahead of me on the road too. Um, but I was a little even more freaked out because they both had partners. Like Andy was in a you know very long term marriage. You know they'd been with this person since college, and Brad and Julia have been together since they were twenty years old. And and I thought, well, if they're struggling and it's that hard for them, what's going to happen to me? I'm all by myself. <laughs> they're leaving me alone. So I, you know, yeah, I it was felt like an oncoming train. I was just bracing myself. But and so. So the show was coming to an end. The kids were about to leave. And I decided at that point, it's like, oh, well, maybe this is a perfect opportunity to take a break from working so hard and parenting so hard. So when actually when my third child left for college, I decided to basically take a break from writing and doing things. So I took a hiatus from everything, which was a terrible idea. <laughs> uh, because I... I suddenly had no structure and nothing to do and nowhere to go. I, I somehow imagined it as like freedom and, oh, I can, you know, chart my own path. I can travel. I can, I don't know what I thought I was going to, I don't really know what I was thinking. I, you know, I did go, I did spend six months or so in Vermont and uh, go down. My, my oldest son was in Boston playing his senior year of soccer. So I did get to see his, his soccer season in college. So that was fun. That was nice. But um, beyond that, I really had nothing to do. I had mm -hmm. two years of just sort of like haunting my own house, you know, just <laughs> wandering around. Like, what was I thinking? Because I didn't have an office to go to. I didn't have, and without structure, I don't get a lot done. Like, I really, I'm a person who needs deadlines. I need, like, I need somebody holding my feet to the fire or nothing happens. Uh, mm -hmm. I was just collecting animals, like rescuing, <laughs> you know, more, more chickens added, more dogs added. You know, I'd look around and be like, this, something has really got to happen here. Or, you know, my kids would come home for holidays and my daughter Annabelle would look around and just be like, mom, it's, it's getting scary around here. You know, cause I have four dogs now and just everything barks when you come to the house. <laughs> it's just, it's craziness, you know? So, um, it was, it wasn't my greatest plan to sort of stop work when the kids left. I should have probably doubled down on the work when that happened. I did write the book. So I did, mm -hmm. you know, that did that something came out of it, but um, it was, uh, I, I really needed a little bit more purpose and a little bit more structure. Would, mm -hmm. I would give that advice to somebody if their kids were leaving to sort of keep some structure to your days. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. I had I had a friend of mine who was a couple of years ahead of me and she gave me very sage advice when she said have something to look forward to. Yeah. Even if it's yeah. tiny tiny. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Have something to look forward to. Don't spend all of your time focused on getting the kids ready that you don't think about the day after. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I Absolutely. think that I think that's very good advice and I I didn't because it it is you know I thought about uh those parents particularly and it's dads too but it was a lot of moms who they had a different uh, day to day than I did in school, but those moms whose day was filled up with they were the room parents and the and the the ones at <laughs> school that spent their days at high school that were whatever their 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 title mm -hmm. was, and I thought, what is going to happen when that kid goes off? Because because truly their actual job was. Mm -hmm. defined by their kid you know I thought at least I can if I want to sort of go out and fill my day up with these things but um I thought it's gonna feel like they've been pushed off a cliff it, and it's I, hard yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah I can only imagine I did I and mm -hmm. I and I and I I wondered and thought like what happens and do they prepare themselves after that because there was so much energy and so much time and 
and thought and um and and that was their mm -hmm. their purpose their day to day so uh but but mine too i mean you know to a lesser extent yeah um, in your book you talk about the volunteering and i i was laughing so hard at that and i know it probably wasn't funny <laughs> But the volunteer for the dog, the dog. dog. Yeah. oh my goodness, and the how strict they were and how serious they were about the volunteer and how you had to make up the hours. And I have been in volunteer groups, <laughs> not with my dog, but similar. And I was like, is she looking in on my life right now? <laughs> <laughs> I think there were a lot of chapters like that where you yeah, were, yeah, felt right, like, she like was, you were talking oh, directly to us. Oh my gosh, great. the amount of time. I mean, you don't have to go into detail, but just the amount of time that you spent trying to keep up with your three visits per month. Well, and then, anytime you try to do a good deed, I feel like, you know, <clears throat> it's the same way. Well, this was a volunteer organization where uh, my dog, I have a golden retriever who's a delight. And I thought, well, I could, he could be a therapy dog. Wouldn't that be great? And so... Yes, you know, first you have to pass the test, which I wasn't sure he could pass. I mean, he's delightful, but he doesn't mm -hmm. do anything really. But he, <laughs> yeah, he passed the test because he's just nice. And um, and so then we started going uh, to children's hospitals and you go to colleges during finals week and you go to old folks homes and rehab centers and all these different places, Alzheimer's care facilities and things like that. And I loved it. I really did. I loved it. But I was also working full time and all three kids were at home. But I thought, but, but it did, I, I really enjoyed doing it. And, but this organization, mostly the people that were volunteers in this thing were mostly retired people. And so um, that was that, that's who was there. And then I, I was sort of an anomaly in it that I still had an active career and kids at home, but they had requirements as you ha one has to, but you had to make three visits a month. And uh, if you didn't, uh, you started getting like demerits and, you know, there was a whole <laughs> website thing and a whole, and it was fine for a while, but three visits a month, which doesn't sound like much, that's but that's but, a lot. It becomes a lot, and you know, during pilot season or during finals or whatever, it and if you don't make your three, then you have to make it up the next month, and then it sort of snowballs. And then when you get to you and the negative column, and then you have like a, a bad, d sad doggy face on your profile on the website, I mean, it's just <laughs> very shaming and it's very terrible. And I would call the woman who runs it and say, Listen, you know. I, I understand why the rules are there because you can't just have people volunteering and then they think, well, anytime I show up is fine because I'm a volunteer. I, I do understand because people are, are like that. They, mm -hmm. you know, they think whatever I give you should be enough because you're not paying me. Mm -hmm. And that was not my attitude at all. I was a superb volunteer and I show, I would, I'm punctual. I'm, you know, I just, I never committed when, and I never flaked. I always showed up. I was always on time. But life got in the way sometimes and I couldn't do it. And she would not give me a break. And I was like, well, I have to take my son on college tours. So I, you know, I'm going to be gone. And then I'm shooting a pilot and the, you know, my dad's sick. I, she said, well, if I gave, you know, if I let you off the hook, then I'd have to do that for everybody. And I said, well, but everybody really doesn't have my circumstances. I mean, I look around at the people that I volunteer with and nobody really works. And all these people had in the plus column, like, 200 visits in the positive because they were making 15 visits a week because they wow. had nothing else to do and anyway it, it snowballed and it was you know i i felt like a terrible person you know cabot had like his picture with like a you know i told you the sad face next to him we he was ashamed i was ashamed <laughs> it was we it was just and it it got into this horrible situation where she told me that if i I could make up for my, you know, terrible performance <laughs> by, she knew I was a writer. She said, if you will rewrite the descriptions of all the facilities we visit on the website, she said, I don't really like how they're presented on the website, but if you'll rewrite all of the descriptions of the facilities, there were like a hundred of them, I'll give you a visit credit for, for every something like hour and a half that you write. <laughs> And I mean, it was outrageous. It was because 
if we wanted to say, I'm a professional writer, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like that's, I don't, I don't think this is equitable for first of all, <laughs> but I put, you know, I didn't want to get too snooty about it. And I thought I just, I have to have my hat in hand because I wanted to do it. I didn't want to quit. And I did. So I tried, I started to rewrite them and I sent and I, and I, and I did my best. I got kind of clever with it. And I told these stories about Cabot, my dog, and, you know, I tried to be funny. I tried to be whatever. I tried my best. And she wrote back, <laughs> try to make, Try not to make them all about you. <laughs> <laughs> like the yeah. ultimate shame. Yes. <laughs> and, and then uh, uh, ultimately we got kicked out. They, we got fired from our volunteer job. And she asked me to FedEx the materials back, my apron and a Cabot's vest and uh, every, I didn't, by the way, I did. Oh, I you didn't? The, the, the khakis, the uniform? <laughs> I, 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 I was <laughs> like. So take the that. khakis yeah. and polo shirt. <laughs> Horrible. Horrible. Oh my goodness. That yeah. was such a good story of the book. That was. Uh, it was. And the, in your I would love to meet your dog because your dog sounds wonderful. Yes. <laughs> wonderful. yes. yes. Yeah. Especially He's when he was up fired. He shouldn't yeah. have. Oh. Well, that, you know, that was a loss to the people because you did say some of the Alzheimer's patients would actually remember him. Absolutely. Yeah. And so that's yeah. That's a shame for the patients who look for the forward patients. to them. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So you, one of the last chapters that you write in your book is the I've done enough chapter where you talk about how maybe you've done enough and it's time for you to release some of that and relax and, and that it's okay to do that once you get in the mindset. And then you sign up with Sony TV. What was it? I want to make sure. Sony Pictures TV for a new pilot. How did it go from taking it easy to, I'm going to get a new pilot. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm not really cut out for, for, you know, not doing anything. It doesn't, my brain doesn't serve. Um, when I, when I let it go idle, you know, it, it gets me into trouble, honestly. <laughs> uh, like I said, you know, deadlines are good for me. Assignments are good for me. So, uh, the opportunity came about for me to develop new television. Uh, the time seemed right. I'd taken enough time off. Um, I still had yet to sort of um, really crack the story of the the this time of life that we're talking about uh, and really tell that story of the woman who in her fifties and, and I, I, it felt underrepresented on television. I, I hadn't felt like I'd done it properly yet. And so I, I still wanted to tell that story and I wanted, and it's not quite the empty nest story. It's, um, it's called Call Your Mother and uh, Kira Sedgwick is starring in it and it's on ABC. We got picked up and so we're shooting it now in this oh, weird good. COVID yeah, world. Good. We're shooting it uh, here in Los Angeles with masks and plastic shields and my, the writers can't come to the set with me and it's all very dystopian and I'm getting tested four times a week and I mean it's all it's all sort of the uh the enemy of comedy in some ways but it's also it's a, it's a very strange experience but we also are on a stage making a show and making comedy and and the show is really about this sort of idea it's sort of the next step after the empty nest and this idea that once your kids do leave the house that these kids in their 20s my kids and a lot of friends, kids, I know, that it's a really hard time, these 20s, when, when they feel like they're supposed to know who they are and what they're supposed to be doing. I think it's much harder than teens. At least when you're in your teens, your life has structure and you know you do know what you're supposed to be doing. You have a job, you're going to school, you're prepping for college or whatever is going to come after high school job, you know, whatever your road is. Um, but you know where you're supposed to go every day and what you're supposed to do. It's all sort of laid out for you. When you're in your 20s, I think it's just, especially these days, you have no idea what, mm -hmm. what, what you're supposed to be doing with yourself. You look around, you look on social media, and it looks like everybody else is doing better than you are. Uh, and I think it's really difficult. I think it's a really difficult time in life. And similarly, I think for those of us in our 50s, we're not mothers anymore we are, but we're not mothering the same way that we were and, or fathering depending, but 
Um, and so we don't know who we are or who we're supposed to be. Um, and so I think it's sort of an existential crisis in a similar way for those people in their 20s and those of us in our 50s that we're both trying to figure out who we're supposed to be and what we're supposed to do now. And so that, that similarity of those two sort of coming of age moments mm -hmm. struck me. And so that's sort of what it's about, where Kira plays this woman who sort of, she's in Iowa, her kids are both in Los Angeles, and she sort of wakes up and it's like, what's happening? Like, I've done all the work of raising these kids, and now I'm, they're just done with me, and what am I supposed to do now? And so she moves to Los Angeles to be closer to her kids and is sort of figuring out what her adult relationship is supposed to be with them and what she's supposed to do with herself now, sort of figure out what her life is now at this age. And while her kids are figuring out who they are too, and they're doing it in proximity to each other. So um, it just felt like there were stories to tell there and uh, it felt like a good thing to do. And I got this great cast. These young people that are in the cast are just, each one is more interesting and unusual and funny and quirky than the next. They're all people that you haven't seen before on television, which is exciting cool. to me. Um, and so, yeah, it felt like the right time to do it and the right story to tell for right now. I think there are a lot of um, women now coming out with second act, second chapter, next journey shows that because there's such an audience of our demographic, 45 to 65, maybe 70, that would appreciate the TV talking to us. You know what yeah. I mean? Mm -hmm. kind of relating, being relatable. So I think it's a great idea. And I think it's, I mean, I can't wait to watch it. Is it coming up next season? It's a mid season for ABC. So we don't have an air date yet, but I'm, I'm guess my best guess is probably January. Okay. That'd yeah. be great. Well, we're excited and we will make yes. sure to share it as soon as it comes out. Cause we would be so excited. Thank you so much for taking time to talk with us. We really sure. appreciate it, Terry. Yeah. And we want all of our listeners to get Aren't You Forgetting Someone book because it's mm -hmm. really funny. It's a great, ice cream. Mm -hmm. it's a great read. It's very, it's very funny and you'll just laugh through 90%. It's, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it has poignant moments too, but you're going to really enjoy it. So thank you for your time. We appreciate it and have a great day. Well, we want to thank Carrie so much for being on our show. It was just a great talk with her and it's so refreshing to read a book about from from someone else that is about our age about what we're going through and with the humor that she uses in the book and i just cannot wait to watch her new uh sitcom coming out yes call your mother, call your mother. Uh, oh I, I, i'm just really excited about it i'm so glad to see sitcoms coming out that are focusing on women in their primetime life exactly. and yes so just you're gonna have to check it out and make sure you get her book um that we will have all the information in our show notes um, how to find the book. You can probably get it at any bookseller or tell them to order it for you if they don't have it. And I recommend it. It's a quick, funny read and we need some funny right now. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> so thank you again, Carrie, for being a great guest on the show. Guys, make sure to subscribe on any of the podcast platforms. Um, make sure to um, email us if you have any questions or comments, hotflashespooltopics at gmail.com. Check out our website and our Facebook group and all those other fun things. Um, and have a great week. We will talk to you next time. Bye.